When I first visited Spruce Meadows in the late 1990s, I got to see the mayor Wei Ha Wei jump in the international ring. Wow, what a mare, what a jumper. And her rider, Frankie Slotuck, called her his blue-eyed lady because, well, she had two bright blue eyes. This might be when I kind of sort of fell in love with horses with blue eyes. I have since owned three of them. Only 8 to 10% of humans have blue eyes, and it's pretty rare for horses too, but not for the same reason. Because as we will see, blue eyes in horses have a totally different genetic history than in humans. First, let's appreciate how incredible blue eyes are. Blue is already pretty rare in nature. Blue minerals are so rare, that's why before there were modern dyes and paints, lapis lazuli was so highly prized. In animals, we also see it far less commonly than reds and yellow, for example. There are various pigments that can be created by living organisms, but when it comes to the palette of color you see in nature, well, mammals did not inherit the most colorful ones. You see, unlike birds, amphibians, and even mollusks, Mammals do not have the ability to make blue pigment. And yet, we have horses and humans with stunning blue eyes. To understand how this works, and then to understand if and how blue eyes are inherited, we need to understand how mammals get their coat and eye color in the first place. Mammals, us, horses, bear, bisons, all of them, can only make one kind of pigment, actually, melamine. But it does come in two forms, however. Eumelanin, that is very dark, and pheomelanin, that is called red, but it's really more of a brownish orange. Think of a chestnut horse or somebody with red hair, perhaps. Faded or diluted eumelanin looks like pale brown, while faded or weakly expressed pheomelanin will end up looking yellowish. So, while you might have learned in school that there's a gene for blue eyes and one for brown eyes, and that the brown eyes is dominant over the blue one, this Mendelian explanation is a very gross simplification that glosses over the fact that, like I said, we can't make blue pigment. In mammals, all the fur color we see out there are in fact a combination of those black and brown pigment I mentioned. Here's how color is created in the skin cells of mammal, and that includes, of course, the cells that make up the iris of our eye. To create any shade with those two pigments, you need to play with the type of pigment and its density of production inside the cell. Now, not all cells can make pigment. Those that can are called melanocytes. So here's a melanocyte with its little nucleus, and they have little organelles in their cytoplasm that make the pigment. That's where the pigment is made, and they're called melanosome. I will refer to them as pigment granules, because really that's what they look like. If you remember ever seeing chloroplasts, what gives plants their green color, under a microscope, perhaps when you were in high school, you will have an idea of what those melanosome or pigment granules look like when they're inside the melanocyte. And inside them, you can find either the black pigment or the brown pigment or both. So let's make different color with these two pigments. If all the pigment granules are full to the brim with the darkest pigment, well, you would get black. But if you get a combination, but still they're packed full, you would get brown or very dark brown. But now, if somehow you don't pack as much pigment in each of these little granules, your color gets fainter. And so we go from black to dark brown, from chestnut to pale brown. So nature can play in a way with those granules to dial up or down the intensity of the color. But what happens if the pigment granule makes very little pigment? If something limits, impedes, or even stops the production of pigment in some of them? Well, then the color is so faint as to look yellowish or pale beige, really. And when talking about the eyes, when you have almost no pigment in the iris, there is another effect that comes into play that has nothing to do with pigment in chemistry, but rather with physics and wavelength. When the iris is very pale, instead of the pigment in the eye absorbing the light, the light is actually reflected and scattered through the cornea. It's the Tyndall effect, and it's the same reason our sky appears blue. It's light scattering in the atmosphere. And that is why in humans and cats and horses, we can have blue eyes. So when you say about a horse that it has sky blue eyes, well, it's true. They're blue for the same reason the sky is blue. Light scattering, not because of any pigment. What about the herit heritability of blue eyes? Well, in humans, there's a mutation on the HERC2 gene that reduces the expression of pigment production in the melanocyte 
of the iris specifically. And if you have only one copy of the mutated gene, then the other one takes over. Remember, we have two of each, one from our father and one from our mother. And so, you still get the normal amount of pigment in your eyes. But if you somehow end up with two copies of the mutation, there is not much production of pigment in your eye. And that's what causes blue eye in the great majority of human. And because it's linked to one gene, we can track its heritability. That mutation appeared spontaneously in humans between six to 10,000 years ago. And we've had it ever since. But is it the same with horses? Kind of. I mean, it's the same reason. The fact that there's very little pigment in the iris. But the gene that causes them are not the same in horses. And I suspect it's not the same as in cats or in dogs. It's all very species specific. Over the years, I have owned three horses with blue eyes. Those three mares all had blue eyes for the same reason. The effect of the cream dilution gene. They were all three of them double dilute, meaning they had two copies of the cream gene that prevented them from making too much pigment, let's say. Elfin and Kiana were Cremello, where Desca was a Perlino. The dilution gene in horses does what the name implies. It restricts the ability of the pigment granule to make the various pigments. So you end up with fewer pigment inside the little balls, the little pigment granule. Now, there's a few of these dilution genes out there. Of course, the cream gene that I just mentioned on chromosome 21, the champagne gene on chromosome 14, but there's also the pearl gene, the silver gene, and the dun gene. But the result is pretty much the same. Less pigment in the pigment granules fades the color, and if it happens to be in the eye, it can fade it to the point of having an iris so pale that the Tyndall effect comes into play, and the cornea makes them look blue. You can also have some cases where the dilution still allows some pigment to be produced, but you still get the effect of the diffraction of the light, and you end up with greenish-looking eyes. So, we have just seen one of the ways that you can affect the color of the eye by playing with the intensity of the pigmentation. The other way is to play with its distribution. To understand the effect or impact of those other genes that play on the distribution, we have to go back way back in the early stage of the embryo, because that's where the disruption begins. To understand the impact of the gene, or rather, the effect of the mutated gene, it can be useful to look at the origin of the pigment-producing cell themselves. To see when, in their formation, their role could be disrupted by these genes. We will consider three stages of the embryo, starting with stage one, that mostly has just a mass of mostly indifferentiated cells, all the way to stage three, that has the fetus mostly formed. In stage one, we have melanoblasts, and they will differentiate into two forms, melanocyte, that will go on to make pigment, and nerve cells, like ganglia cells. In the next phase, the melanocyte will migrate to either the neural crest or remain part of the neuroepithelium, and that will effectively split them into two groups, though that will be in the skin, and those that will form the iris of the eye. One gene that acts very early on is the EDNRB gene that impacts the differentiation of the melanoblast into either melanocyte or ganglia. This is the overo gene. The next stage where we see a disruption is at this point here. And this is where the two gene implied in the splash white play a role. And it's so early on that it affects both skin and eye pigmentation. PAX3 is crucial for the survival and the migration of the melanocyte, while the MITF gene is needed for the production of pigment. Any disruption on either of these genes and you get an incomplete pigmentation of the animal. Finally, we have the very mutagenic kid gene that governs the final migration and distribution of the melanocyte in the skin. There are over 50 mutations associated with the kid gene, and it creates the various Tobiano, Sabino, the dominant white coat variations. And of course, we already saw that the various dilution gene impact all pigmentation production in the skin and in the eye. At some point, of course, the overall gene, by extension, will have an effect on the distribution of color we see in the skin, not necessarily in the eye, but sometime. So, as you can see, we have quite a few genes that can potentially cause blue eyes by working at different time and on different protein pathways. If you want to know more, or if you want to see the whole list of articles and reference that I use to create this, I will be posting them on my Patreon page. 
All right, so as we just saw, because of different gene acting at different time, we have different level of predictability of when the blue eyes are going to crop up. But there's no reason that you can't also have a combination of all those genes at play. And that's how you end up with such a variation of color, white pattern, sometime blue eyes, sometime not. And that makes it very difficult to predict and very hard to determine what part has been inherited from what parents. But I hope that this explanation helps you understand that simply to say, oh, well, the horse has blue eyes because the white on its face is technically not true, since the reason for the lack of pigment in the skin or the weak pigmentation in the eye are not the same. That is how we end up with white-faced horses with dark eyes and dark-faced horses with blue eyes. So, in the end, are blue eyes heritable in horses? I mean, with the double dilution, like cream and champagne, then yes, they are 100% predictable. And with the splashed white, there are some combination of those two genes that causes that pattern that are sometimes compatible, and so you can guarantee that you will get blue eyes on splashed white potential folds. But beyond that, it can be very much hit and miss, and they can crop out the blue, so to say, like in the case of Wei Hai Wei, and then never show up again. Wei Hai Wei had a solid dark brown sire and dam, and so she was a complete surprise when she appeared with all that white. And we know that her blue eyes were not necessarily caused by the white on her face. So did she have a unique mutation? Maybe she was a one-off event. She produced many folds, and while I didn't find tons of information on them other than their name and who their sire was, the two that I could find picture of were chestnut, but they didn't have her blue eyes. We have here a stallion with this apparition of blue eyes out of nowhere again, but this time on a completely dark coat. And while his name pays homage to Wei Hei Wei, he is absolutely and in no way related to her. I think blue eyes will remain a bit more of a mystery in the case of horses than they are with humans. At the time of this recording, I just opened up my Patreon membership for those of you that would like to support and encourage the channel. I want to say thank you to Joan for being the first one to do so. You can check out the various perks of being a Patreon member by visiting the website. I will put the link down in the description, or you can use the QR code that will appear on screen here. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you on the next one.